So we'll move on to our third presenter now. Val Valerie Mainz is Professor of History at the University of Leeds. She earned a BA with honors in the history of art at Birkbeck College and a PhD in art history at the University College at the University of London. She's the author of numerous books and articles about the art, culture, and heritage of 18th century France, and specifically the French Revolution. Most recently, 2016's Days of Glory, in Imaging Military Recruitment and the French Revolution, published by Springer. Her work has included curating two major exhibitions of the art and sculpture of the French Revolution, one in France and one in England. Professor Mainz's paper is entitled Observation, Science, and Experimentation in David's Double Portrait of Antoine Laurent and Marie-Anne Lavoisier. Thank you very much. Thank you. And that this was in opposition to the knowledge of facts. In contrast, Lavoisier was remembered by Proudhon for his work on experiments in a laboratory and for generously communicating with colleagues and friends to advance knowledge through observable facts. Proudhon laments the cutting short of Lavoisier's life on the scaffold and presently forecasts that posterity will judge Lavoisier only on account of his scientific discoveries. No. Um, just the, uh, yep. Yep. yep, that's fine. today deals with the magnificent double portrait of Monsieur and Madame Le Boisier that was completed in 1788 by the most celebrated painter of the day, Jacques Louis David, and that since 1977 has been in the Met in New York. Given the orientation of this particular panel on painting, history, and constructions of early modern identity in France, I shall also end my presentation with an all too brief showing of a David self-portrait. My argument today is concerned with the art of the portrait at a particular time in the history of France. The early modern portrait that is, we could perhaps say the Western European portrait from the Renaissance on, but before the inventions of photography, certainly functioned and continues to function as a record of appearance. A painted portrait is also a material object that has been carefully constructed in certain ways and within certain conventions, codes of representation, context of patronage, and many other historical factors. These belie the communication of the sort of observable fact that Pujo was espousing in 1801. That the portrait is a representation whilst also functioning within specific historical contexts of representation, is by now a truism for the historian of, the art, of art, which I can't accept. Yet some of this might not be so self-evident for the historian. So I thank Christy very much for organising this panel and encouraging me to participate within it. Marco Beretta's monograph about Lavoisier uses portraiture to map the physical appearance of the scientists and thereby gain insight into aspects of the scientist's background and professional career. Included after Beretta's main text is a select catalogue of 56 depictions of Lavoisier in imagery produced between the early 1770s and 1990 in various formats and in a range of media, including oil, pastel, bronze, marble, 
plaster, terracotta, engraving, etching, aquatint, and the font. Using the material object in this way accords with a recent turn in the history of science, in which the creation of things serves to provide key insights into knowledge production, alongside and in tandem with the deductions perceived to be contained in theoretical texts. Moretti's work has been useful for me in that he suggests that the scientific instruments set around Lavoisier offer up to the viewer a practical demonstration of an investigative experience or experiment. I shall now pursue this argument to make the additional point that the invention and the creativity of David's picture making arises from a recognition that the manufacture of the hand, of the body and of the senses exists alongside the ideas of the head, of the intellect and of deducible reason. Mary Vidal's work on the painting has for focus um, the affectionate relationship between a husband and wife couple. Madame Lavoisier had reputedly been a student of David and in this painting a sheet filled artist portfolio rests with the cloak on a chair by her side. These accessories complement the display of scientific instruments to the right of Lavoisier. Besides providing illustrations for her husband's Traité de Chimie of 1789, Marianne actively contributed to the scientific research being undertaken, translating English and Italian texts on chemistry into French, keeping lab registers, and promoting the so-called new chemistry in the salons that she had. In making the case for this picture's modernizing elaboration of the traditional theme of the muse and the interrupted scholar within the social context and historical circumstances of late 18th century France, Vidal brings out the fusion of the arts with the scientists that the artist David has been able to set up in this double portrait. Now, Madame Lavoisier provided 13 pages of illustrations to the pâté élémentaire de chimie avec figure that was published just at the time David's painting was being completed. The treatise took the form of a textbook for those new to the discipline of chemistry, setting out the procedures whereby experimentation and the observation of facts would allow for the making of objective judgments and deductions. Beretta has plausibly surmised that the portfolio might contain Marianne's designs for the illustrations to this text, and that Lavoisier might be shown here to be at work making his final corrections to the treatise, which was apparently finished just a few days after David's completion of the painting. The suggestion endows David's work on the picture with an additional narrative dimension. For the purposes of my own argument here, dealing with the implications of knowledge production on the margins of modernity, the scientist's slightly earlier preface to the méthode de nomenclature chimique is pertinent too. The preface to the nomenclature sets out a concise system for the naming of chemical elements and in so doing, it contributes to the reform of both science and language. The project of standardizing the naming of chemical elements was a result of a collaborative enterprise fostered by Lavoisier with the support of the Academy of High Art des Sciences. In obtaining an understanding of the physical properties of elements and gases, the hallmarks of the new chemistry resided in the testing out of rationally formed hypotheses through the doing of systematic, repeated experiments, observations, and measurements, and via the use of precision instruments. Language was to be used instrumentally as a way of enabling chemical inquiry to proceed from the known to the unknown. The relationship between ideas and words in the service of the new chemistry was envisaged 
as a dynamic and creative one, and it was one in which the reform of language would work alongside the reform of chemistry to transcend already known ideas. Just as mathematics used algebra to facilitate the operations of the mind, so did the deductions of the new chemistry, which were now to be grounded in reasoned observation, deserve their own shorthand, as there was to be some sort of reasoned relationship between the chemical element and the name given the chemical element. What I shall now suggest is that David's painting of the Lavoisiers entails a reasoned verism in its visual elaboration that is in line with this altered approach to the language of chemistry. The very centre of David's painted composition is taken up by two juxtaposed hands, that of Madame Lavoisier, where on the corner of the red velvet table cover as she looks out at the viewer, possibly indicating her appreciation of and communication with the painter David. The husband, on the other hand, has been caught in the act of looking up to his wife, but also in the act of writing. Next to her resting hand, his hand has fingers clasped round a quill pen with nib poised on manuscript sheets of paper. By these sheets, two further quill pens erect in a glass inkwell wait to be used, but also form a link between the other elbow resting hand slash arm of the chemist on one side and the chemical instrument of the gasometer on the other. David's mute figurative composition provides the view of the painting with visual links between knowing, seeing, looking, writing, and making. What we have here is both a visual intercommunication and a practical demonstration of reasoned observation. I've got another couple of pages, is that all right? Good. Uh, painting the glass balloon on the ground um, against the stunning red velvet drapery of the table has allowed David to bring out the patently transparent properties of glass. Two divided, slightly askew, white rectangular patches have been brushed in onto the con convex curve of the glass balloon so that the outline of this glasses form is used here as a visual device serving to reflect the suggested light sources of windows high up outside the depicted Victoria composition. And I just need to quickly add at this stage that it, unfortunately it's some years since I looked at the painting in the net, but when I did I was gobsmacked. <laughs> <laughs> um, David's manipulation of paint in visually recreating such an optical effect allows viewers of the painting to exercise their own powers of observation, grounded in their own reasoned judgments, to appraise, for instance, how the artist has skillfully manipulated in his brushwork coloured pigment onto a two-dimensional surface to achieve a desired effect. Painting signed in the lower left corner, El Dabi, Parisis, Anno. 1788. The Latinization marks out the maker's pretensions as a history painter and someone of learning. David's portrait falls within the established grand manner portrait traditions being large and imposing, having figures set within some undefined but still highly classicizing interior, and with the gigantic fluted pilasters of the interior decoration seemingly rising up to infinity. Yet, this was not the first time that David had depicted a sabon caught in the act of writing, even though the chosen format and dimensions of this painting I shall now are quite different. Antoine Schnapper considers that this portrait is probably of the doctor Alphonse Leroy and that it is likely to have been exhibited at the Palace Salon of 1783. Leroy was a well-known gynecologist and they even have attended Marguerite Charlotte, David's wife, 
at the birth of the couple's first son, Jules, on 15th Feb, 1783. So here, on a reduced scale, we have just the one figure of the savant fixed in painting on canvas, communicating to the viewers of posterity, caught in the action of writing, his presumed great thoughts on paper. The thinking writing doctor here rests one arm on a book by Hippocrates. Besides him is a newly invented oil lamp that works as an accessory and also perhaps suggests the enlightening spirit of the Savile. This is clearly a more intimate work than the grand manner portrait. Yet even without the bravura pretensions of the double portrait, it still indicates something about the value being placed by the artist's study on the Savile, on the depiction of material objects, on scientific inventions, and on words, thoughts, and deeds. So. Five years later, the grand manner of the portrait of the Lavoisier couple has not been activated merely in terms of an array of elaborate, elaborate decorative attributes, although the polish and gleam of the scientific instruments certainly also contribute to the overall aesthetic effect of the imposing and monumental work of art. Instead, the adaptations of myth and history to be found in the historiated portraits of, say, Van Dyck, Reynolds, um, uh, um, what David has done is instead to produce a new type of realism to do with the effects of life and the ex of light, sorry, and the experience of the effects of light uh, on the observer. We know that Lavoisier went to the guillotine on 8th of May 1794. I think it's safe to assume that his activities administrating the collecting of tax revenues on behalf of the French state before the outbreak of the revolution made him a marked man when the terror got going. Similarly, it was probably for this reason too that it was decided not to exhibit David's magnificent portrait in the Paris Salon of 1789 that opened on 25th of August, effective Saint-Louis, the King's Name Day, and just six weeks after the attack on the Bastille. During the terror, that is, we could perhaps say, from the law of suspects of 17th September 1793 until 27th, 28th July 1794, the coup d'etat of Thermidor and the downfall of, Thos of Robespierre, David sided with Robespierre as an avowed Jacobin. By then, he had become a painter politician having been elected a deputy to the National Convention in 1792 and having voted for the death of the king in January 1793. Arrested after Thermidor, it is believed that this self-portrait was painted in late 1794 when he was in prison. So, I think we need to take on board the fact that this self-portrait is in quite a different format and produced under quite different circumstances to those that pertain to the magnificent grand manner portrait depiction of Monsieur and Madame Lavoisier. Regrettably, there is no time today to go into the complexities of David's self-portrait because, in my opinion, that is yet another story to do with painting, history, and the constructions of identity on the margins of modern forms. Thank you.